All right, now then, number six. six two technicians are discussing the re retrofit procedure. Retrofit procedure. Isn't that where you put R twelve to R thirty four? Yeah. You gotta have like if you're gonna do that. Look, the thing about it is you don't have a lot of need to do that anymore because just about everything nowadays has got R134 in it anyway, mm -hmm. or whatever. But now they're going to talk about going with that uh, 1234 refrigerant. It's 100 dollars a pound, so go, that's gonna be fun. Do what now? That 1234 refrigerant. They're gonna come out. They're coming out with. They're trying to get it put in there within the next couple of years and all the cars all over the world. It's 100 dollars a pound. Why wow, so much? Uh, because they're stupid. With all due respect to everybody involved. I mean, they're, what they're doing is they're worried that R134 is doing something to the atmosphere. They don't really have any proof of it. I mean, that's this way that I, my take on that. Uh, it basically doesn't have chlorine in it, so it's not hurting the ozone. But they're considering global warming a problem, and they're saying R134. That's what they're wanting to do is they want to come up with something else. And it's the ridiculous amount of money they want to charge for this. Imagine that little container of R134 that I've got in there that I pay like $140 for with all 3000 bucks. A can that size that's, of it, you know. So that's stupid big corporation yeah. trying to follow. But you anyway, want. when you're retrofitting from like a 12 system, we don't want to fool with 12 anymore yeah. because to begin with, 12 is getting to where it's so expensive and hard to come by. They're not making it anymore. Yeah. There's some people that's got some rat hole at their house. I got the one guy told me he had a case of it. He, you know, give me if I needed it. I didn't even want it. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, 134 in my perspective works as good as R12 anyway on most systems. Uh, but anyway, let's talk about this retrofit. Um, the retrofit procedure. Technician A says the service ports must be changed to match the new refrigerant. That is true. Yep. Technician B says a new label must be installed over the old one to identify the new refrigerant and all. I'm supposed to do that too. Uh, furthermore, you cannot put the new, you're really supposed to, if you do this the right way, you're supposed to replace the accumulator and you're supposed to flush the system out before you do that. And you're actually supposed to add a high pressure line that's got a high pressure cutoff switch and all that stuff. But what most, mostly what has been done is you just add some oil that's compatible and you put the fittings on there and you, you know, make sure, make doggone sure you got all the R12 out. Now I was talking about this the other day to some of you guys. I don't remember who it was. But uh, on a cold day, you won't get all the refrigerant out of one unless you heat the car up. If you close the hood and let the engine idle, and let it idle so it's a little blistering. You know when it gets so hot you can't touch anything without burning your hand under there? You want it to get that hot. And while it's that hot, and I like to have the hood down while I'm doing it, I'm going to pull the refrigerant out then. Got it? Not with the AC running, but with the car running and making that heat. You'll get the refrigerant out that way, just about all of it. The new equipment, the J2287 uh, or whatever it is, I can't remember the, date, the number. For some reason it's left me, but the point is the new uh, refrigerant, uh, recovery equipment is supposed to be better at getting it all out than the older stuff. Now, my machine works really, really good. Uh, but what happened on my Jeep, and I'm going to tell you this story because it's really important. Uh, my Jeep holds 1.2 pounds of refrigerant. Most of these new systems don't hold about a pound or so, which ain't very much, you know. So I'm going to say, and it does a good job. So I says, well, periodically, just as a, a form of demonstration, I would pull the refrigerant out. If you've got one that you think is low on refrigerant, this is eating an AC class, guys, so pay attention to what I'm saying. If you've got one you think is low on refrigerant and you've got certification, you pull the refrigerant out and you weigh it. Right? And then you put the right amount back in there. You don't just add some. Because if you put too much, it's not going to cool right. Why? I mean, Why? more is not much? better. More is not better because it makes head pressures go up too high. Oh, okay. See what I'm saying? Yes, sir. All right, and so... Uh, also, you can get so much oil in there that it coats the inside of the evaporator. It don't work good anymore either. You know what I'm saying? So you got to be careful about this stuff. You, more is not better. You got that? Yeah. All right. So that's like keeping poor in transmission oil in one of those that you have to, you know, check with transmission fluid by pulling the plug outside. Don't keep pouring it in there because you're going to make trouble for yourself. All right. Here's the long and short of it. I get my Jeep, and periodically over the years, we pull the refrigerant out, and I would put back in the right amount. You know, and I've had the thing since it was nearly new, and it was a, it's an 01 model, and we were doing it here at school. All right, so one day I was going to replace the compressor. And so I, you know, did the work order thing, got me a compressor coming, all that kind of stuff. And I went to pull the refrigerant out of the Jeep. Now remember, the capacity is 1.2 pounds, right? So I pulled the refrigerant out of it. You remember this story? You remember this story? How did it turn out? Remember? Yeah. But it's in that handout. 
Okay, so I co- when I, I, I vacuumed it and I went in my office to let it just pull, I, and I, I'm sorry, I recovered it. I didn't vacuum it. Um, I recovered the refrigerant out of it, and I went out there and I had recovered about 1.3 pounds, which was more than what it was supposed to pull out, and the head pressure had gone back up. Now, see, the, the oil that's laying in that accumulator has got refrigerant trapped in it, okay? In that, in that oil, kind of like shaking a Coca-Cola or something, you know, it comes out of there. Mm-hmm. Okay, so it outgassed is what they call that. And I wound up with showing another 30 PSI. And I said, well, I need you to recover again. So I hit recover again. By the time I got through doing that over and over, because it was kind of a cool day like today, uh, I had pulled uh, over two pounds of refrigerant out of a 1.2 pound system. Me, I mean, here I am wondering why my AC wasn't working good. My compressor was working. You know what I'm saying? Of course, I put a compressor on it in general principle anyway, because I'm rich and I don't care. You know what I'm it didn't make any difference. I mean, that's popped one on it. You know? And uh, but what happened was you got to be careful to make sure you're getting all the refrigerant out, so you don't leave a bunch in there. And that's the long. End. That, you know, that's the end of that. Okay. So retrofitting these guys right here on uh, on number six. Yeah. Okay. Number seven. Two mixing two different refrigerants. Um, Actually, it, all of those. It makes an Ill, a contaminated mixture that's expensive to dispose of. That is true. Uh, as a matter of fact, I have got some mixed refrigerant that I have pulled out of vehicles that had mixed refrigerant in them. But I'm talking about like if you do the refrigerant analysis with our machine and it says it's, some of it is 134, some of it is 12, and some of it is propane. Propane? Yeah, people make, they make a lot of cheap refrigerant. will have doggone propane, butane in it, all kinds of stuff because that works too for refrigerant. Yeah, and then the police will come up. Whoop! <laughs> <laughs> grabs him by the shirt, but grabs him by the collar. <laughs> it creates a zeotrope. What is that? Uh, a zeotrope. Um, basically, it's sort of like a compound that you don't, it's very unpleasant. As a matter of fact, if you pulled out your smartphone and did a what is a zeotrope search, it would probably give you a dictionary definition of it. But I know that it's something bad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to mix refrigerant. It's also illegal. <laughs> Number seven is D, all of these. Right? Uh, two technicians are discussing the practice of topping off an R12 system. Technician A says the practice is no longer profitable. Technician B says it's not recommended because of ozone depletion, which technician is correct. Both okay. of those guys are right. A container of R134A is color-coded what? Green, white. light blue, yellow, or white? white. No, that's 12. R134 is light blue. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not that. Now, what, uh, you know, uh, go start. Well, hold on, let me, let me ask something. My dad puts R134 in the house. Oh, in the house air conditioner? Yes. Sir. Well, did it cool? Yeah, it works. Yeah, you're really not supposed to do that, but if it cools, it cools, you know. Uh, <laughs> Joey, Joey could answer that question better than me. The, 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 heat, and, the heat and AC guy for houses, mm-hmm. he does it. He could, uh, he could tell you, you know, why that was a bad idea or what, would, what it would eventually cause. If it's not compatible with the oil that's in there, I may have eventually just put it in the pour, pour all, the, all the oil out of it mm-hmm. and everything. Because the guy that put it in broke, had broke a pinhole in it, Mr. Richard. You can, you have to get a magnifying glass to see the pinhole. Yeah. And all of it come out, and they wanted $1,500 to come out and do it again. Yeah. <laughs> so said, okay. That's the way that kind of thing works. Yeah. We braced it up. Yeah. And yeah. put all, all, all 134. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes they don't, they're just not thinking clearly. Uh, a potential safety hazard when working with refrigerants is A, container explosion, B, asphyxiation, C, frostbite and blindness, or D, all of the above. You can get all of those, you know. If it, you know, Everyone needs to have safety glasses on when you work with air conditioner. That's why I have these $500 safety glasses that I wear right here. Okay. All right, now then, um, they really shouldn't cost that much, but they did, excuse me. All right, now then. When R12 comes in contact with flame, a toxic gas called what is formed? Phosgene. Phosgene. Did you look it up? Zeotrope? No. Oh, okay. okay. You can probably speak it into your phone if you've got a really smart smartphone. I got a phone, but it probably is. Yeah. Uh, when working with a refrigerant. Right, hold on, now. How do you say it? Zeotrope. Zeotrope? Yeah. Hold on. Let me figure out how to do it. I ain't never done it. you got to hit the little microphone button. On your keyboard. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. He's on sets? 
Well, no, mine won't do it. Second rate phone. All right. Here we go. All right. Um, you can <laughs> We're working with a refrigerant. So refrigerant oils, you could do what? Uh, avoid breathing the vapors. I think that's a good idea, don't you? Uh, what about avoid contact with your skin? Or both A and B, or neither A and B? That's both of them, isn't it? All right, technician A says butane and propane will work with, as refrigerants. Yes. I wanted to tell him a while ago. Technician B says these gases present a fire hazard during service procedures, which technician is correct. I would say both those guys are right on that. Technician A says the recovery tank used in a recovery system must be checked and certified every three years. Technician B says a disposable refrigerant tank should be properly evacuated before disposal. Uh, who's right about that? B is right about that. It doesn't have to be inspected? Every three years, no. Uh, the most common automotive refrigerant prior to the 1990s was R12. That is not a hard question, okay? Technician A says R12 refrigerant released into the atmosphere damages the ozone layer. That's what they say. Technician B says holes in the ozone layer allow ultraviolet light to reach the earth, which is technician is correct. That's number 16. That is C. Um, I was going to tell you this. Uh, sometimes, like... I would run into cars, and it's, this happened used to happen very regularly. I would run into cars that had R12 fittings, on and, have R12. and then all of it. I mean, they would have a hundred percent R134 in it, and they'd have R12 fittings. I mean, every last little bit. They would How have, did they do that? I don't know. It's really hard to get it all out of there, but somebody did. And a lot of the times, what they do, and it's totally illegal, is they make a leak. And they just let it sit out there. You know what I'm saying? They do. They make a little leak. They loosen a line or they loosen a, some. Uh, oh, I didn't know it had a leak. Everything goes out of it. And then they come back later after it's been, the end, they see they've done that a while and they're driving it around. The car's been hot a lot of times. And then they, you got to pull the air out before you put refrigerant back in. Now, let me tell you something. Everybody in here something before, you, before I forget and somebody does something ignorant. Uh, sometimes when people get used to seeing me, you know, refrigerant, uh, test a system and it says 100% 134 but maybe it's low like it's only got like 30 pounds of uh, static pressure and said well we know it's low we know the thing's short cycling we know it's not working right instead of hitting uh, you know you're, you're, you're going to hit recovery to get that out of there right but what will happen is they'll take the system apart and it will fill up with atmosphere after they've delivered after they pulled all the refrigerant out they do their work, they replace the line, they replace the accumulator, they put some more range in there, whatever, and now they've got a system that's completely full of atmosphere. No, they hit recover, and they pull that air into my bottle to say, how good is that? You know what I'm saying? You don't recover air. You vacuum it. You know what I'm saying? But I have had people do that. You know what I mean? I'm saying, and I'll tell somebody, don't hit recover when the system's full of air. And don't hit recover. Don't even hook my machine up to it if the refrigerant identifier says it's part 130 or part 112 or part R12 or have hydrocarbons in it. You know, now if it's got, if it's showing that it's got some air in it, that's not such a big deal. You can get the air out of the tank because the air is going to go, you know, to the top of the tank anyway and you can just bleed it out of there, you know. Yeah, but, you know, there's, a, there's other ways to do that. But one way or another, the first worldwide effort to limit the use of ozone depleting chemicals has became known as the Montreal Protocol. Right? You got that? Um, yeah, we got too much ultraviolet light reaching the Earth's surface results in A, increased instances of cataracts, B, increased instances of Lincolns, uh -huh, I'm kidding, increased instances of skin cancer, C, destruction of oceanic plankton, or all of the above. I guess all of them. All of the above. The ozone layer primarily filters what kind of radiation? All right. And the ozone layer uh, is in which of the Earth's atmospheric layers? Stratosphere. Right? It's in the stratosphere, that's right. And that's all those questions. Now then, what we got to go to is we've got to go to our pop test. Now you guys, uh, I guess you guys would like to go ahead and just guess your way right on through that pop test. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah. All right. Okay. Now I've got that. There's ten questions on that pop test, and that is a grade, right? All right. Now what I want you to do, I'm gonna give you guys about ten minutes to talk among yourselves. I'm gonna leave the room. I'm gonna give you guys about ten minutes to talk among yourselves. Brandon, do you have your hand out? 
Where are you? Are you ready to go? That is the hand that I'm talking about. That is the hand that I'm talking about. Now, you guys work your way through that. Uh, that is an article I wrote for Motor Age in 2009, and it's going to give you information that you won't find in any textbook. Okay, so that's one of the reasons. All right, All right. you got that. I took that thing home to study, and then I got sick because the dog went and did nothing over the week. Yeah, we don't like that. Oh, yeah, I did. I had bronchitis. Wow. I had bronchitis. Okay. Okay, well, I'm going to give you guys 10 minutes, 10 minutes, and I'll come back in and resume. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, what are we going to do here? Let's look at the very first one here. Uh, if you have normal high and low side refrigerant pressures, which is 20 to 30 PSI on the low side, 150 to 300 on the high side, let me say this. You're going to have higher pressures on a hot day than you are a cold day. When the day's cold, and there aren't any good static pressures, like if you hook the gauge up, nobody's got any numbers for what good static pressures are supposed to look at. But usually if you see from 60 to 100 pounds static, you're, you know, pretty good shape, but that don't mean, that's not a go no go test. Uh, static pressure is when you hook it up without the system running. How much pressure is in the system without the compressor on without the engine running? That's static pressure. Dynamic is whenever the compressor is running and things are happening. That's dynamic. Static, this basically means in a state when nothing's going on. Okay. Gotcha. Uh, you still got warm air from from your register, but you got normal refrigerant pressure. Now, let's say you're feeling of your suction line. What is your suction line supposed to feel like, you guys? Cold. Sweaty and cold. And your liquid line is typically going to be hot. I mean, like really hot. Yeah. And all that. Like so, in, yeah, you're going to hold it. Yeah, you know, it's real hot because of the, the, just the nature of what's going on in that refrigerant system. You're squeezing that refrigerant into a high-pressure gas. It goes through the condenser, and the condenser actually it condenses into a liquid. And when it comes out of the condenser, it's a really hot liquid, unless you're operating a subcooler. Now, do you remember me guys telling you about a subcooler? Yes, sir. Looks like a condenser, but basically what it does is after it has condensed the refrigerant back into a liquid, it cools it off. <coughs> the Sonata has one like that. You can typically tell if one's got a subcooler because the uh, on the side of the uh, condenser, the receiver dryer is built onto the side of the condenser, and it's a long, skinny thing. That usually means that you got a subcooler, okay? Uh, so... What are you going to do, though, to, do, to determine if you get normal pressure, but you still got warm air? Uh, what do you do to determine if the heat's coming, if the heat you're feeling is coming from the heater core? Pinch the heater core. You pinch the heater core inlet and keep make sure that make sure if you got a heater control valve, make sure the heater control valve is closed. The heater control valve will always be in the heater core inlet. If you pinch the heater core outlet, pressure will build up in there. You probably bust the heater core. Well, I mean, it doesn't get up over 16 pounds, does it? Well, it's, it's pumping. The, the, it actually sort of does because of that's coming right out of the water pump. Right. That's not just expansion. That's actually pressure coming from the water pump. So that hose coming from the water pump is going to be the one that's shoving uh, heater core. You know that little hose? Yeah. It's going to be shoving uh, coolant through the heater core. And that's the first place that coolant goes when it starts to get some heat from the cylinder head. Yeah. And the cylinder head gets hot before anything else does. You know what I'm saying? The heat eventually spreads out the whole engine, but it starts at the cylinder head and the cylinder wall. Uh, but the cylinder head is really, is really hot, really fast. And that's the hottest part of the whole engine, the cylinder head. Right. All right. So um, so basically, you're going to pinch the heater core inlet. Make sure it's the dead gum inlet. If you pinch the outlet, you're going to bust the heater core. Remember I told you the bigger hose on the heater core, if you can figure, if, if it has a bigger hose, is going to be the outlet. But, you know, make sure you know how it's done. Don't guess at it and say, well, I think this one here's the inlet pinch. Poof. All of a sudden, your heater core is leaking, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> okay. Uh, Ford uses a strategy called CASS. What do these letters stand for? No smart aleck answers, please. Okay. And what is the purpose of the strategy? Huh? You know, making up something that stands for the abbreviation. Yeah. That is a Korean brand of beer. Right. Yes. <laughs> really? <laughs> I knew somebody was going to come up with something. Okay. Uh, compressor anti-slugging strategy. If the compressor is mounted very low in the engine compartment on the vehicle, what happens there is the oil has a tendency to settle in the compressor. Now, what happens if you try to start operating the compressor and those pistons are trying to squeeze oil? It's going to slug the compressor and the belt's going to slip and all that hot way. And so what we want to do is we want to start turning the compressor kind of slow to move that oil out of there so that whenever it starts pumping good and hard, 
it's going to be able to just be pumping air and not be trying to squeeze any oil. The oil will move if you do it slow. It's going to go over another. So they energize the compressor clutch while you're spinning the engine over, and that turns the compressor slow, and then you're managing to get your get things moving before it starts up. Okay. If the low side is showing, now if you guys went through this, you should be able to answer these questions without sitting here looking at there with your mouth open. If the low side is showing a deep vacuum and the high side is showing not a whole lot of pressure, in other words, if both sides are showing low, what do you suspect in there? Expansion. Somebody tell me. Come on, you guys are supposed to know. An orifice or an expansion valve. An orifice or an expansion valve. If it's clogged, you're going to have that. And I'm going to tell you something we ran into once out here with a Toyota Camry. Uh, we had low pressures on both sides. We went into the dash. We replaced the expansion valve, which on the Camry is inside the dash. And that silly little expansion valve was no fun to replace. Well, we put one of those in there, and we fired it up, and it was just like it was. just like it was. Everything was low. And so we pulled the evaporator off, and we tried to see if it was clogged any kind of way. And I couldn't tell that it was clogged. But we put another evaporator on it because we had a new one in stock, and that took care of the problem. Now, I'm confused as to why that did that, but when we put an expansion valve on it, that's supposed to take care of it uh, in a situation like that, but it didn't until we replaced the evaporator, and then it, it was fine after that. So that's just, you know, I can't always explain to you why something happens the way it does, but I know that it does, right? Okay, contaminated or blended refrigerant should go into what color container? Somebody say it loud. Gray container with yellow top. Gray with a yellow top. Very good, Chelsea. What can cause liquid refrigerant slugging? That means the liquid refrigerant is making it to the compressor uh, when nothing but gaseous refrigerant should be there. Who knows? That's when you got oil in the wrong parts of the HVAC system. Somebody should have been able to come up with an answer to that. It's in the handout. What did you come up with, Brandon? Huh? Well, you're actually going back to the other, but I'm talking about in a system where everything else is working right. If you've got a clogged cabin air filter, you're not going to get full evaporation. You don't want any liquid refrigerant leaving the evaporator going to the compressor because you can't squeeze liquid. What needs to be coming out of the evaporator is low pressure gas. And if there's liquid still in it, Either you've got pine needles or leaves or something in there that's keeping the refrigerator, or, I mean the refrigerator from fully evaporating because there's not enough airflow through the uh, evaporator. Just keep that in mind, you know, and, and don't uh, don't play dumb with me. I know what y'all did. Y'all said, if you'll just wait until he comes back in and he'll give us the answers, we won't have to read the handout. Uh-huh, yeah, I know how y'all think. Yeah, I got your idea. Oh, you read it. Okay, you got all the answers that Chelsea wrote down, didn't you? Uh, Chelsea read it today. Chelsea's an overachiever. Chelsea's so far ahead in her academic classes, someday they tell her she don't even have to come in there. You know what I'm saying? And so, anyway, they feel like she's uh, already spanking everybody else in the class, right? Okay, so um, some high-end vehicles can have as many as how many AC air system? Ten. AC system airflow actuators. Some of the Mercedes cars will have a bunch of them like that, and they've got them all hooked together with a CAN bus. And, some, and what they'll do is... I mean, they do a whole bunch of different things, but they'll have this can bus. They'll have all these actuators like this lined up along here. And I'm not talking about physically, but in the schematic, if you look. And they'll have a can bus that's talking to that side, and they'll have a separate can bus talking to the other side. Can and the bus. reason for that is, if this can bus gets damaged, it can still talk with that one. It's redundant. It's kind of like a military thing. You know what I'm saying? All right, pretty cool. All right. You guys just bear with me for a second. You shall not surely die. All right. Uh, why would a technician spray water on the condenser as the AC is system operates? Seems like cold. Huh? Seems like Well, it's supposed to be hot, but I'm going to look for spots on the condenser where it's actually not hot. In other words, if, let's say I'm spraying it on the condenser, and you got a condenser that looks like this right here. I mean, you know, the condenser is here. The condenser is where the... The compressor feeds the refrigerant in here, and it goes all the way through here, evaporating, and then it comes out in a liquid line, and then it's going to go through your orifice. Okay, there's your compressor right there, and I'm going to spray water all over this. This whole thing ought to evaporate that water really fast. If there's places on it where it stays wet, 
Now, I know that in that place, it's not going it's clogged, internally clogged. And I'm talking about with leaves and stuff, it'll be clogged on the inside with some flat sound or something. When you unzip a refrigerant system, removing the refrigerant lines, compressor, or whatever, what should be checked for clogging? Uh, or if it's tube or the, the expansion valve, right? You need to make sure that's not clogged. A lot of times, that most of your professional air conditioner guys, when they pull that system open, they're going to put an accumulator or a dryer. Now, oh, let me ask you this. Uh, have I ever talked about this before? If it's got a fixed orifice, it's going to have an accumulator, which is the big can in the suction line. If it's got an expansion valve, it's going to have a little can in the liquid lamp, as far as the dryer. You know, the desiccant bag? In other words, the little can in the, in the, uh, in the line. I had that when it was cut open around here somewhere. This right here, this right here is the one that's in the uh, liquid line on the ones that have an evaporator. And the, the accumulator is the big one. And I got one of those cut around, too, that I should have probably already had up here. Uh, okay, so... You're supposed to be uh, recognizing the fact that if you have an expansion valve, you're going to have a dryer in the liquid line. Remember that? An expansion valve is. Uh, and have you ever seen an expansion valve? You guys know what it looks like? Have I got some? Huh? Where's one? Yes, I'm sorry. That is one expansion, one type of expansion valve. The low side is here. The high side is here. As this goes through there, the temperature causes this alcohol chamber to actually change the size of that orifice. That's why they call the other one a fixed orifice. Because see the liquid line, it's actually going to change the amount of refrigerant that can go through here. And mostly what they're trying to prevent on those kind of things is they're keeping the uh, evaporator from icing up. Because if the evaporator ices up, you're not doing anybody any good because no air can flow through an iced up evaporator, right? Yep. All right, there you go. Uh, and, and I got a scroll compressor we took apart over here, sitting over on the floor. Right over there on the floor is a scroll, scroll compressor. It's pretty cool. You pick one of those apart, neat looking thing. Uh, is that the one that we took apart? Like when, remember when we took apart last semester, I think it was? Or replaced something in it. A scroll compressor? I don't know if it was or not. Hmm. Well, I don't, know. I don't know if you were here when we took it apart, but we had to replace the compressor on, I think on Michelle Goosby's car or something. And we just pulled the old one apart just to see what was going on in there. It doesn't really have a lot of movement. Yeah, that was me. Remember, it's yeah. got the. It's got those two scrolls that, yeah. that go together, and I can show it to you. Okay. Like an old pump. Well, not really. It's, it's, they're two spiral scrolls, they're like a cinnamon roll, oh, yeah. you know, that are working in, in and amongst each other. And I, I can, we'll take one apart and look at it. Um, and, a scroll, and a scroll compressor, one of the two scrolls is blank, and the other is blank. Fixed and rotates. Huh? Fixed and One is fixed, the other one rotates. Why should every technician... Why should every technician do an AC work be certified? You get $32,000 $32,000 fine if you work on an AC system and you're not certified. And uh, Remember what I told you the other time, you can actually work on it in your neighbor's yard if you don't charge him anything. If it's a freebie and you're paying for the refrigerant and everything, if anything changes hands, you better be certified. In other words, if he even gives you a pack of pork chops or a kiss on the cheek or anything like that, you better be certified. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's the <laughs> and that concludes the pop test. All right.